Hello, everyone. My name is Claire Hitchens, and on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University Press, I'm pleased to welcome you to the launch of The Cigar Factor of Issei Rodenberg. Wilfrid Laurier University Press is located on the Haldeman Tract, part of the tra traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples and symbolizes the agreement to share, to protect our resources, and not to engage in conflict. We are grateful to the Indigenous peoples who continue to care for and remain interconnected with this land. Through the work we publish in partnership with our authors, we seek to honor our local and larger community relationships and to engage with the diversity of collective knowledge integral to responsible scholarly and cultural exchange. I have just a few housekeeping announcements and then we'll turn the event over to our host. If you'd like to purchase the book, it can be ordered from any bookseller, but we will also put links in the chat to our website for North American readers and to our European distributor for those outside North America. Please take note of the discount codes to get a special deal. Closed captions are available for this event. If you wish to use them, you can turn them on. The panelists will be taking questions later in the program, so please feel free to type a question into the Q&A box and we'll get as many to them as many as we can. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the link on our YouTube channel and social media. So you'll be able to watch it again and send it on to anyone who missed it. I'm thrilled to announce our host for today's event. Anna Porter is the multiple award-winning author of 10 books, both fiction and nonfiction, and she spent about 40 years as a book publisher and editor. Welcome, Anna, please take it away. Times and came through it all. And it's written by two of his grandchildren, whom I will now introduce. Hella Rottenberg, or Rottenberg, as she's known in Holland, is one of the two authors of the book. She's a freelance writer, she's a journalist, she worked as a political and investigative reporter. She was a correspondent in Prague and Moscow during the collapse of communism. I'm sure she'd have some really interesting things to say about what's going on in Ukraine today, but that's not what she's going to be talking about. Um, she, her sister, her um, cousin, Sandra Rottenberg, works as a freelance journalist and producer for a wide range of media, public debates and political fora. She produces podcasts and chairs public debates on social and political issues. Her publications include a bibliography of women in the media and the history of the squatters movement in the Netherlands. I'd also like to introduce the translator, Jonathan Reeder. He will be joining us today. He's a native of New York and a longtime Amsterdam resident he enjoys a dual career as a literary translator and a performing musician, but he will not be playing music today. The afterword is written by um, Robert Rotenberg, our very own Rotenberg. Uh, we have two of them on today's uh, uh, program. Um, Robert is uh, a former, well, maybe still criminal defense lawyer, but mainly he's a writer. He's written a number of best-selling novels, most of which I've read one time or another, and they are truly enjoyable. Um, and we're also joined by Michael Levine, who is a fourth cousin, nine times removed. Um, I, I have some difficulty figuring out all the Rotenbergs on this, uh, on in, in, in the world today because there are so many of them. And oddly enough, they all originate from a tiny little place in the middle of absolute nowhere. I think it's pronounced Ivansk. 
Now, welcome everybody to today's event. I would like, uh, well, I'm not sure which one of you wants to go first, Hella or Sandra. Oh, I would like you to talk a little bit about the book and how you came to write it. And then perhaps it'd be really nice if you could read a passage for us today. Okay, shall I, uh, shall yeah, I start? Sure. Um, well, there was an, uh, uh, an advertisement in a, a Jewish weekly uh, announcing that um, people who, who would think to have a claim on uh, some assets in the former um, East Germany should uh, submit their claim by next month. And that was the final call to do so. Um, one of our cousins saw this advertisement and we uh, looked at the link which was mentioned, the internet link, where all the former Jewish owners were listed. And to our amazement, our own grandfather was one of the names listed in this list of former owners. And the, um, the, the great uh, thing about it was that not only his name was mentioned, but also the, uh, the, the, the location where his uh, factory uh, used to be. And this was the first, uh, in fact, fact that we got to know about this rumor that he, before the war, the Second World War, owned a factory in Germany, which was nationalized, taken from him by the Nazis, uh, and after which he was imprisoned in Nazi Germany and uh, fled uh, to, back to Amsterdam. And from that moment on, uh, well, I, I started to search for more uh, more I, uh, facts about it, and from then on, in fact, uh, the, the the this research uh, went on until it uh, became a book. Um, Sandra, would you like to uh, would you like to add anything now to this and uh, yeah. do, and do, maybe read a little for us? Yeah, we can. Well, with uh, in more families, you have this 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 story. So you do, you are not sure if if it's true or and it's it's never told in a whole in the whole story from begin to the end, and and the story about the factory we only heard once on the funeral of my father when his sister suddenly told something about it, and that we remembered when Hella found some more information that there was a factory and in combining that 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 tickled our curiosity and and made us go on this itinerary in and in, in looking for if we could find more but we didn't know if we were able to find so well you certainly found a lot of extraordinary material uh, um, I, I didn't introduce Michael Levine earlier, but when he Michael is um, is on this uh, is on on the uh, Zoom call today on the Zoom book launch, and it's Michael who brought it to my attention in the first place. And he Michael, by the way, is a recovering entertainment uh, lawyer. He's also an agent, and uh, and I would love him to talk a little bit about how his impressions, because he first told me the book is a detective story. So Michael, uh, before the reading, could you just uh, talk I'll, a tiny bit about why, how you see it as a detective story? Well, why I see it as a detective story is that the, uh, our two distant cousins, uh, Sandra and Hella, 
um, knew nothing about the background of their grandfather. And if you read the book, you will see how they put it together piece by piece and finally understood. I should state for the record that my mother was born Frida Rotenberg, so I am not here under false pretenses. And in fact, Bobby and I are third cousins, not 48th cousins. Um, in, in any event, what, what basically happened is, is that I tripped upon this because we have a, a great variety of, in, in our family, including my Hindu cousin, who is half Hindu and half Jewish, who was the grandson of Louis Rotenberg, who, if you read the book, you will find out from Robert, was the great connector who kept the, the whole family together. And in 2017, at a party uh, for all my third cousins, um, he walked up to me and said, do you ever go to Holland? My mother had a friend there. They thought they might be cousins. Well, of course, I'm basically a detective myself and took that information and discovered my cousins. That's the background of how it all began and why I think it's a detective story. Well, thank you, Michael. And Sandra, I, I am hoping that you will now um, talk a little more about the book, but mainly um, also read a little bit. And, and I was hoping there might be some photographs that uh, you could show. Sure. Sh shall I shall I start? Uh, uh, we we will uh, read uh, both of us, but uh, uh, I'll start. Am I still to be? Uh, are you still hearing me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. As youngsters, we never really gave much thought to why our, our grandfather's time in Germany was taboo. Uh, th this is us when uh, we were teenagers, in fact. I, this is our grandfather with his seven grandchildren. Uh, I, Hella, am on his left when you look at the, at the picture, and Sandra is on his right, and the others are our brothers and cousins. Uh, so many things were simply not talked about. The pre-war years were cloaked in a haze. And if anything was discussed, it was mostly in the form of scattered anecdotes. There was no way to weave it all in a coherent story. My mother, whose knowledge of the details was only secondhand, occasionally alluded to the Nazis having stolen granddad's fa factory and putting him in jail. But more than that, she either didn't know or wouldn't say. My father, Alfred, the son of Esai, never talked about it, nor did Sandra's father, Edwin. Our grandfather, when we knew him, was the director of the Amsterdam-based family business J. Rottenberg & Sons, a manufacturer of plastic drinking straws and tubes he had set up after the war on the Nieuwe Keizersgracht, and where both of our fathers also worked. He was the boss, and even as children, it was clear to us that he was an entrepreneur to the core. Naturally dressed in a suit and carefully chosen necktie, handkerchief in the brass pockets, gold cufflinks and elegant Italian shoes, he was self-assured and resolute. His sons, our fathers, on the other hand, were cut from very different cloth. Unkept hair and ill-fitting suits, disorganized and wont to launching into rambling stories. They were reluctant businessmen. Isai Rottenberg's dominant personality was always front and center. He was like a magnet. Whenever he entered a room, he would stand silently and wait for as long as it took for the attention to turn to him. Only then did he greet the present, those present. He was small and stocky, as you can see in the picture, and he had a round, shiny, bald head, a good-sized nose and large ears. His eyelids were triangle, triangles from behind which his dark eyes observed the world 
with curiosity and amusement. He left his mark on our fathers, our mother, and us grandchildren. We looked up to him and were fascinated by him. When we were little, the family got on well. Grandfather was the patriarch, with his children and grandchildren circling in orbits around him. Later, though, there was a falling out that had to do with the factory. Edwin, my father, broke with his father and brother, went out teaming, siding with Edwin and their brother Alfred, and his father remained loyal to Granddad. In addition to our age difference, Hella being somewhat older than me, this bad blood determined the role our grandfather would play in both our lives and how we remember him. Even now, decades later, the rift colors our memories. Thank you. That's uh, that really is a great introduction to your uh, to your grandfather. I uh, oh, there's a great picture of him now up on the screen. Um, uh, this is him in his twenties, we think, when he well looks like an entrepreneur with his uh, his his cigarette that he had always in 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 his hand, smoking one after another. He didn't smoke cigars. No, he didn't. <laughs> we never saw him smoking no. cigars. Can you explain this? Uh, what we're looking at now. Uh, yeah, this is um, the, the um, uh, it, one of the dossiers which we found in the uh, in the little town where the factory was located. At first, they the in the archive they couldn't find anything, and it seemed that nothing could be re retrieved about the, the history of the factory. But when we talked to the archivist uh, and mentioned some of the facts which we unearthed until then, uh, she started looking again and on, at another, uh, in another building on an attic, she came back the next day and said, maybe I found something. And then we went into her big room and there they lay 11 thick dossiers with uh, thousands and thousands of documents all concerning the factory of our grandfather. Letters and, and uh, newspaper cli clippings. And the first thing we saw was his own signature. So this was a, 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 an incredible, a, a incredible uh, uh, thing discovery. to find. Yeah. Discovery, yeah. Sounds fun. But did um, the, um, the, the photograph I, I in, in the book, there's a photograph of um, um, a workshop or, or the factory floor. And there's a photograph of on the cover of the book of the factory itself. Um, yeah, here as it you used see. to look, but also as it, as, how does it look now? Well, if you flip through the pictures, Maya can do that. Here you see that was an, one of the amazing things that also we found in one of those dossiers, these pictures of the yeah. factory and that it was, had really been there. Um, and that you also see how people were at work there because the special thing to know about this factory where our grandfather father came to Döbeln in Eastern Germany in 1932, August, half a year before Hitler came on power. Uh, the factory has been settled by another Jewish entrepreneur and who, he went bankrupt. And Isai Rottenberg took it over. He heard about it and we think it was just the thing he liked because this was innovation. This was the most modern factory in Germany, maybe in Europe, we don't know. But as you can see, all these cigars were made by machines and of course accompanied by people to lead in the different materials. Um, we have seen the same uh, machines in the Netherlands in an old uh, cigar factory, completely the same. Um, but it is a wonder that these pictures came up. So yeah, but maybe Sandra, you should tell that 
the, at that time, all the cigars were handmade. And there was not, no, no machine in, uh, involved yet. And these were American machines brought over to Europe to launch a, 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 the modern way to make cigars. And that played a big role in the conflict of our grandfather with his competitors in Germany who, who couldn't compete with this modern machine made uh, cigars and wanted to ruin and stop this factory. And especially as he was a Jewish entrepreneur and Hitler came to power, that gave them a chance to try to stop the factory and to ruin it. Yeah, that's exactly, that's... Well, there, there's, there's a great deal in the book about the, uh, his discussions and debates and attempts to convince uh, everybody that, uh, that the, using the machines would actually um, not only create cigars that were just as good as handmade, but would employ more people, which is a kind of an unusual argument, I thought. How did you find out all these arguments? Well, one of the most wonderful things we found in these dossiers were, were the, the, the complete report on, yeah. on, on two uh, meetings with our grandfather and then as you see on this picture the nazis who take o took over the city council um and with his competitors and then we of course if you find a, a dossier the the all the things that are in it are not ranged in in the order <laughs> you want to 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 have you can you really have to dig further so what we did, we, we, we went to other archives, for example, in Berlin, and um, Hella also went to Leipzig and Chemnitz. Um, and there we found uh, also other archives, for example, from the uh, cigar um, branch, um, um, where, where there was also a large discussion on what was going on because of this factory was exceptional and everybody wanted to have this factory but it was very important as you already mentioned for uh, the fact that so many people could find work there well this is uh, the, the picture you see here is um the the um the in the city hall the the, the town hall the meeting uh, room and uh, we, we found this meeting room after we saw the minutes of the meetings where our grandfather, uh, well, discussed and tried to save his factory from the hands of his competitors and the Nazis. And here must have been taken place those, those meetings. And as you see, the, the, the hall is in, in uh, and the, uh, uh, the chairs and the table must have been from the from the 30s so this this looks just as if he was sitting there and it was like we stepped back into in, in history and saw him sitting there trying to 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 save his factory and trying to uh, to argue that uh, his factory didn't put people out of work but uh, meant uh, something for the employment of the the, the uh, workers yeah. in this little town. But to our astonishment, that is why um, history is, is so interesting. You 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 cannot imagine uh, the conversation that we found because we found out what we read was that the city council, the Nazi uh, mayor, for example. Uh, took our grandfather, um, he protected him because they could not miss this factory because of the, the, the work people employed. And that was amazing. They did that for two years, despite all the, all the pressure that was, uh, was on giving, um, kicking him out of, uh, uh, of this factory. Could you talk a little bit about the timing of when 
all of this took place because it is it's quite extraordinary for a, for a Russian Jew with a Dutch passport to operate a cigar factory in Germany under the National Socialists. So uh, he could you I mean the time this this uh, the main story takes place during a time of persecution. May, may, maybe can you put the, uh, my picture on when I talk because I don't see myself uh, next to. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, great. <laughs> Otherwise, it's difficult to uh, to to join in. Shall I try to uh, to uh, to to uh, tell answer? Yes, please. Could talk a little bit about the time that the, yeah. this. What was going on in Germany and in Europe in general at well, the time that he was running this factory? Yeah. Well, the funny, the strange thing was that he bought this factory in, in August 32, when the political situation in Germany was already very instabile. There were uh, all the times, uh, well, um, uh, fights on the uh, uh, street fights, the fights, uh, political, the, the, the government was changing all the time. Hitler was on the rise, but not still in power. And uh, in August 32, there were in fact parliamentary uh, elections where the, uh, the party of, of Hitler became the largest party. Uh, but then our grandfather apparently had already decided to uh, buy this factory. He had a firm in, in Amsterdam at the time. He had a family in Amsterdam. Uh, he had children, three children uh, who went to school, his wife, his, his uh, parents-in-law. But um, in, well, the 29 and 30, where uh, the, the Wall Street crash, and maybe he lost, or we are sure he lost a lot of money and, and maybe his, his uh, business didn't go well anymore. And he was somehow connected to the tobacco industry and found out about this factory and saw a, a big chance to, uh, to own this factory and make, make a real good business out of it. And he loved to run such a new thing. So he went to Durban and, and, and tried to, uh, to buy the, 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 this uh, factory and he, he, he did so. And he took a lot of risk. And then in January 33, after he bought it and tried to start it up again, Hitler came to power. Um, I think one or two months later, the uh, SA, which are the uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call the fighting brigades of, 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 of Hitler uh, came into his factory and tried to, uh, to, to arrest him and his partner. Uh, he was taken to Dresden to, uh, under arrest and then after a few days apparently freed again and could continue um, his his work in the factory, and um, he he had, of course, to deal from that moment on with a Nazi government. Not only a Nazi government in Berlin and Dresden, but also in this uh, little town Döbeln. Um, and the the Nazis took over the the, the administration of the town. But as there was so much unemployment at that moment, they were happy that someone employed six or 700 people from the town and its surroundings. And they didn't want to uh, chase him away because of the fact that he employed so many people and he was a good employer. And the uh, uh, employees were happy with him and the way he, he ran the factory, apparently. And so he, he could continue against all odds, in fact, because his competitors tried to stop him. There was, in fact, uh, made a special decree by Hitler, which uh, um, uh, 
uh, forbid to make cigars by uh, ma machines, machine-made cigars. And he managed still to, to uh, continue his production um, by, well, uh, arguing and by negotiating, et cetera, et cetera. And this continued until August 35. And at that moment, um, uh, the Deutsche Bank uh, took over the, the factory and uh, he was at the same day arrested and uh, uh, brought up to, to Berlin, imprisoned uh, and uh, charged for fraudulent uh, dealings. And um, the, the factory was, uh, well, taken into the hands of somebody else and later, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, sold for, for uh, by the Deutsche Bank for much more uh, money to a competitor. And our grandfather uh, uh, set, uh, was imprisoned for half a year, I believe, and then set free on um, uh, conditions that he would come back. The charge, he was still charged by, uh, for fraud. And he went to Amsterdam uh, to visit his family. And then to our great astonishment, he didn't re stay in, in, in uh, Amsterdam, although the uh, Dutch diplomats told him, don't go back, you're a Jew. Remember, the, it's not safe for you. He went back, he had a Dutch passport by that time, and he thought he, he could manage it. He went back and started to sue the authorities for taking away his factory. And he, um, he continued suing them until Kristallnacht 38, when there was this great rampage by the Nazis and killing of the Jews. And then he finally, finally understood that it was a lost case and that he should not come back again. An amazing story. And, and he really uh, was such a tenacious man. <laughs> Incredible. So in in uh, some someplace in, in the book, um, you refer to him or quote somebody else referring to him as a person who was reckless and maniacal, which I thought, now this is, uh, I don't know how all that was in the original Dutch, but those are the words uh, you use and, uh, and, and in pursuing his, his, uh, his business interests. Uh, but how, I mean, all of this time he was continuing, I, I just, I find it amazing when, when you knew him, which is much, much later, had he become a very much less uh, maniacal person or was he still somewhat like that? Still, he's still, I think his, his business came first. For example, about Hella lived next door. She saw her grandfather often, more often, but we, my brother and I went for lunch once a week we always had to wait till he came back from his factory because he forgot we were coming or something. Um, so he, 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 he couldn't leave this. This was what he wanted to do. And the, and, and the interesting thing is that after the war, he started again with innovating and probably we, we suppose that he turned back to the same machine builders in, in the United States to build machines to make this, uh, str this uh, uh, drinking straws. That's amazing. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Was, but did you, um, was he warm and Oh yes, friendly? he was very warm, very warm, uh, very warm uh, grandfather. Uh, I lived next door to him and um, well, he was the rock in, uh, uh, in my life. In fact, when I was small, my mother had went to, through the war and was traumatized very much. 
and uh, he 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 lived through the war and had had a lot also uh, of of terrible uh, experiences. His whole family perished in in Poland, but he was like a rock, really. And he was a very warm feeling person, and I uh, I loved him so much. I remember him with 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 great warmth. He trusted. He was, uh, yeah, um, to us children, he didn't do as if we were little children who weren't important and couldn't know and understand anything. He was treating us as equals. Yeah. So he was telling you stories? No, that was what, he put, that was, that, that was what I felt as a child and that had also to do with the changing family uh, ties because my father stepped out of, of the factory. He, they worked together, two sons and a father. Um, I always had a feeling he was really intimate in, and, 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 and cuddling you and kissing you. And in the same time, he, he had a, a great distance. Because if you ask about his youth, for example, then, then he stopped the conversation, just walked away. Didn't, he, he didn't say anything. And that's something that we, by doing, by writing this book and digging into this history, and also because we have <laughs> attained a certain age, that you do, that we do understand much better what he survived, that he lost most of his family, and that that he also he also was traumatized, and that he pushed it back in his memory that he he could not could not reveal anything any of of his his memories on on his family his sisters his mother uh and and his youth and that is a pity because as a child already as a teenager he was already very entrepreneurial and and courageous uh and there are uh stories we we found out only because my father did before in the in the in the fifties did research and 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 had the correspondence with everyone he knew uh, in the world of the family to collect stories on his father, and so that was another source we had. But otherwise, we we didn't know we did not know so much about him. Uh, did he he never talked about his childhood in Ivansk? Never. No. No, but his he he didn't. We we found out we went to Poland to to find out more about him, and we the only then understood that he he, he did factually didn't live in in Ivansk. His parents moved to to Lodz, to Łódź, when he was very small, and um, and he 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 went to school in 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 the in in the large industrial city of of Lodz. Of Łódź, yeah. So uh, and you you went there to to find out more about him, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. And what did you find out in Woods? Well, uh, we found immediately <laughs> the house they have been living on the first cross road. We looked on the sign of the street, and that was the street. This is the street, <laughs> and then we looked for the number, and then the house was still there. We didn't know which which apartment they lived, but that that was oh that was the first time it was in two thousand ten that we stepped back into history, and That's then really we amazing. didn't know about the factory at all. That was the years later. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. The uh, all the, the the family members who stayed in uh, Ivansk or in Vodz did did they uh, the ones who remained who they did not. Married. Emigrate. Did they all perish? Yeah, yeah. There was one uh, brother of his who went to Sweden before the war. He survived. And there was one sister who went to Palestine before the war and she survived. And that was it. And there was one brother who left for France and lived apparently in France and he was uh, caught and arrested and uh, sent to Auschwitz. Auschwitz yeah. So uh, oh. there was no one left, in fact. 
but in uh, in in Ho he stayed and his family stayed in Holland. No, uh, for how long? Could you could you describe a little bit about what happened after Kristallnacht, after he was jailed, after he lost the factory, and he's back in Holland? And could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, he 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 uh, started a new. Uh, uh, enterprise again uh, after he came back in Holland because he was left without any income, of course. And then the, in uh, May 1940, uh, the, the Nazis invaded uh, uh, the Netherlands and occupied the Netherlands. And then in the beginning, they apparently they they didn't try to flee yet because they well, waited to see what was going on and they didn't know what to do apparently. And then when they started to, um, uh, to catch the Jewish boys from the, just like that from the street, um, uh, uh, our, uh, well, the family got together probably and uh, the, 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 the boys, the, the children of Isai and uh, uh, the rest of the family of his wife, in fact, uh, decided that the, the, the boys should flee. And then two of them uh, went first and reached Switzerland through occupied territory, which was very dangerous. Then uh, Sandra's father left for uh, France and uh, tried to reach England. And then my father left and tried to reach England. It took them a year before they, they reached England in the end. And after they had, had left, uh, our grandfather, grandmother, and our aunt, their daughter, uh, fled uh, through Belgium and France to Switzerland. And they reached Switzerland in August 42 just before, well, the, 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 the mass deportations uh, started. Yeah. Just before it would have been too late, if, if they yeah. had waited. If they would have uh, been there three more weeks, it would have been too late, in fact. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 the family of, of, of uh, Isai, his wife, and three children, they all survived by, by miracle. And it was, in fact, an exceptional thing after the war that an, a, a Jewish family from Amsterdam survived as a whole. It that, is an extraordinary that, story. Yes. It was an exception, really. And uh, our fathers, um, well, joined uh, the British uh, uh, fleet and fought for two years. They With were in the marine. They were they were the allied forces, so they were really fighting against <laughs> the enemy. That's so they uh, were were heroes and not so much victims. It's uh, it's I mean it's one of the one of the the extraordinary things about reading this book is um, while so many uh, members of the family uh, perished. At the core of your side of the family uh, managed to stay alive. Yeah. Um, and on the, um, oddly enough, uh, one of the people on the um, um, on the chat line appears to be uh, the uh, Leontine Rottenberg's daughter, granddaughter or grandson. I can't tell. S. J. So, um, so that's one of the people on in the audience. Now, I'd like to bring in uh, for a moment. I'd like to bring in the uh, uh, where is he? I can't see him. The Canadian Rotenbergs, yeah. And uh, Robert, um, you're you're on. I think you're on here, uh, Robert. Um, even though you're a Rotenberg, actually you're a Rotenberg. You, what happened to the other T? Uh, well, I can read a very small passage to tell you. I can't see myself in the video. Can, can you put me up? I can see you. Can you see me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, um, 
I had the privilege uh, through Michael, working with Michael in the book to write the afterword to the book. Can you see the book that I'm holding up? Yeah. <laughs> I can't see myself. Maybe someone could put me up. I'm just going to read briefly from this. It kind of gives the North American side to, to the story. Um, here we go. Uh, we were a Canadian family. The Rotenbergs, who arrived in Toronto in the 1890s, were a tremendous success story. Energetic entrepreneurs, a number of brothers, including my grandfather Max and his brother Louis, started a company, Rotenberg and Sons, which brought in thousands of Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe. Their logbook that records all the names of the details of the passage, the Rotenberg Ledger, is one of the most prized possessions of the Ontario Jewish archives. Often when I meet people, I'll go online with them and look up their family names so they can see the actual signatures of their ancestors. Like Issei, the Rotenbergs were savvy. They integrated quickly into Toronto society. There was a humorous and treasured letter that Louis wrote about the need to change the family name. The rotten with two T's, extra T, was shrewdly dropped. In fact, I can tell you half the time I'm in court, I'm still called Rottenberg, just so you know. Um, for our generation of North American Rotenbergs, the Dutch Rottenbergs had been mostly a forgotten tale. I'm not quite sure why. In part, my parents' generation had gone through World War II and they clearly wanted to look to the future, not the past. And this was all a uh, generation removed from them. I have a vague memory of hearing about extremely distant relatives somewhere in Europe when my oldest brother was going to travel there. But it seemed remote, something that wasn't really a part of my sense of myself. As a Jewish kid growing up in Toronto, I was very aware of the Holocaust, but it always seemed distant to me, something that happened to others. Many of my best friends to this day are sons and daughters of survivors, but not me. So then I was reading this book, and as I'm reading, I see my own family. Issei's industriousness mirrors my grandfather and his brothers, who after their travel business, turned to building office towers in Toronto. And actually, when I hear about you talking about your grandfather, when I hear about my own grandfather, I remember my mother saying, I mean, he was perfectly dressed and incredibly warm and affectionate man. Um, and the story of my distant dust cousin, cousins and authors of this book, writers and journalists, as are so many Rotenbergs throughout North America. But still, it is, there is that distance between me and this history. After all, this is, excuse me, after all, in my life, I really never encountered uh, any significant anti-Semitism living in Toronto. This was something that happened elsewhere, a continent of lifetime away. Excuse me, until I read, this is from the book. It was reported in Dear Steamer, a virulent anti-Semitic German tabloid of the day the inf that informed readers with joy that the Jew, Issei Rotenberg, was no longer in charge of the Deutsch works uh, in Dublin and the company had not a single Jewish employee. That was not someone else. That was not another family in a ledger or in a shrine. That was my family. That was my name. That was me. And that's the real point of this book. It's not just a history of is a cigar factory. It's not just the story of his granddaughter's valiant quest to find him. This book is about all of our connections. All of our, and for any Canadian, we all live this life of immigrants. Uh, to the past, there lies inside each and every one of us. So that's my little reading. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, uh, I just uh, I just wondered if people are aware that they can ask questions. If you if you want to pose some questions to um, anybody, any of the Rodenbergs or Rodenbergs uh, currently on screen, um, please, please do so in the chat uh, in the chat box. Um, I'll be able to see them and I'll read out the questions. Um, I think maybe other people can see them too, but uh, Michael uh, Levine. Yes. Michael, uh, would you would you like to add a little bit about your own connections to this story, uh, which are 
obviously many because I've heard you talk about the Rodenbergs for, I don't know, maybe 40 years. So could you Anna, I've been boring you to death in the stories for a long time. My great inspiration is the brilliant historian Simon Shama, who wrote a, a wonderful book called Belonging, which is the history of the Jews from 1492 to 1900, and how they ran from country to country to country, first welcomed, then not welcomed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have always been fascinated with who am I? Uh, we've now gotten to a point where we have in our family seven religions and five races. Uh, so from my point of view, it's all humanity. But who I am, who the DNA is, has always been of great, great fascination to me. And of course, my, my greatest joy is the fact that in our family, there are 24 published authors and only one literary agent. You can't beat that. <laughs> How many people in the film business, Michael? <laughs> Probably 24. What, what can I say? No, but, just, but I, it's always been great. fascinating. We did a, a great film uh, called Hollywoodism, Jews, the Movies, and the American Dream. And the, the fact that, that the cultural roots of the Jewish people were so strong, uh, as were the family roots, notwithstanding the prejudice and everything else, has always been an extraordinary inspiration to me. That's wonderful. Has there ever been a family reunion? I don't think there's a room large enough. <laughs> there is a brilliant man. I know he is uh, online today, Ira Rotenberg, who actually comes from a different Rotenberg family, but has been our genealogist wor working with Lisa Newman. And the, the bottom line is that we have managed to put together a family tree back to 1697, which, which wow. give given what's happened in the world, particularly to the Jews, is an extraordinary accomplishment to which I take zero credit. This, that's, that's sort of, uh, it's, it's revenge on the Nazis. Exactly, yes. exactly. It's, it's yeah. It um, one of the participants, and I can't see what the names, like I can only see initials, um, corrected me when I said that the, the um, the Jews of Ivansk and Wuj were all, of your family were all, uh, they, they all perished. He said, no, they did not perish. They were murdered, which is of course, absolutely correct. Um, now, since we're open to questions, um, the first question I see here is, um, has the family reconciled over its split that Hella and Sandra mentioned? Has the family reconciled? Yeah, I think so. Next oh. generation did. Yeah. Our generation did, in fact. Yeah. We, 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 we didn't speak about it so much, but we decided that we should not continue this controversy. This, this had no use. Uh, but it's, it, it was continued by your parents. Yeah. yeah. Both of they were both they were sides. Good. Yeah. So there were no winners or losers. Oh, only losers. <laughs> well, well you, you, see, you, you, you do see that in a, in a lot of Jewish family. People who, who are grieving and, and cannot find a way to, to out that grief, they get mad on each other. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yes, I think you're probably right about that. And there's some, often they sue. Yeah, they resort to the courts. Yeah, right, Michael, although you're a recovering lawyer, you, you, uh, Robert, you're still a lawyer. Yes. And this is one of the things that happens. Um, I want if there are, are there any other questions? Um, oh, here, here's the per person who, uh, I think the person who asked that question was, I wish I could see, PB, oh. Phyllis Burke. Yes. Okay, yes. uh, I assume Phyllis is is a Rotenberg, but no, no. Know. Phyllis is the wife of my great friend Bruce Kidd, the extraordinary Canadian athlete, uh, and uh, and herself with with some or all Jewish roots. Not sure, but no relation. Shockingly, 
just uh, friendship. Well, there is uh, there's a note here from Ira. That's Ira Rotenberg, the genealogist. Yes, who says uh, if anyone's interested in the Ivansk Rotenberg family tree, it's on ancestry.com. Okay. Zakaria Rotenberg family. Um, just as while we wait for more questions, um, Sandra and Hella, uh, despite the family feud, I take it the two of you have always been friends. Yeah, well, we, we met again when we were students, in fact. We hadn't seen each other for, for a long time. Aha, Robert, that's your phone. <laughs> guilty, guilty. A criminal right, lawyer so, yet. <laughs> so you hadn't seen, you had not, but you'd not, you'd met as children. Surely, yeah. But yeah. after our grandfather died, there was no um, uh, place where we, we met anymore until yeah. we ran into each other by chance in town. Yeah. And then uh, from that moment on, we, uh, I, we I, reconnected. I I was having a drink in a cafe and then Hella entered. <laughs> and we, we were so happy to see each other after such a long time. But you knew each other right away. You, I mean, you, there was yeah, no... Immediately, immediately. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. And then... We are the only girls in the family as well, as you saw. Ah. Now, did, yeah. uh, did Hella tell you at the time that she'd been looking into this story? Or not? Did oh, this story you? wasn't. This we found out about this story uh, in, in 2014. So and then, 2014. Yeah, and then, then, our, so and then our, was, our, it was long after we 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 ran a, a decades later. Well, maybe may, this this would be a very good time for me to mention um, that the book is a bestseller in Holland in Dutch. It is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very significant bestseller and stayed on the list for many weeks. Could you talk a little bit about that, either of you? I mean, what was it like to become a best-selling author? Well, the, thing, the, the, the nice thing about it that it was uh, shortlisted for the, uh, uh, for the uh, prestigious history prize, book prize, and uh, was one of the five books which was uh, shortlisted out of many hundreds. So that was a great honor, in fact. And uh, well, there were reprints, but uh, uh, and and we were uh, able to to give uh, presentations and talks, and people were interested in it. So we are very happy about it that it uh, that people were interested in the, in this story, and that the book well, was. A success. And I, I think people will be interested in the story um, in English as well. I, I think the translator was uh, at least for a little while on yeah. the uh, okay. on this call. Do you, does, yeah. I'm here. Now. Are you there? <laughs> I'm um, here. I, uh, uh, I, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the how the book um, was introduced to you to start with and where your involvement and um, and how you found the story yourself. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I think I was uh, approached either by the Dutch Literature Foundation uh, to, uh, to consider doing the book. And then I got a call from Hella asking me to have a look at it. And she very kindly put a copy in my mailbox two days later, very shortly after that. And one of the things that I remember really getting a kick out of when I read it was I was thinking, everybody's talking about their grandfathers. Now it's my turn. My grandfather was a Polish Jewish immigrant to America, to Syracuse, New York, in 1904. And he was an, he did not, did not own a cigar factory, but he was an entrepreneur. He owned a vitamin company. And, but he was, funnily enough, for somebody who owned a health food company, he was an avid cigar smoker. And <laughs> <laughs> he loved cigars. And even when he, when he had to stop, he lived to be 96, so it didn't apparently didn't, didn't do a, a whole lot of damage to him. But when, Very he healthy. Stopped, <laughs> when he stopped smoking cigars, I think when he was probably in his 60s or 70s, he would walk around with an unlit cigar in his mouth the whole time as, uh, as 
cigar smokers tend to do. And I remembered having been given all the little paper rings that come around the, that are around the, the, the those paper bands uh, and wearing them as rings. And, and when he bought in fancy cigars, he would give us uh, the, these, the aluminum tubes that they came in and we filled them with whatever kids fill things, fill those things with. So I already had a, an instant liking to the theme and to the story, uh, aside from the, 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 the difficult aspects of it. My grandfather and his family uh, lived in America during all the, all the 20th century, so they didn't, have, they didn't go through anything that the Rotenbergs did. Uh, but there was, there was an immediate connection, and uh, we eventually uh, yeah, worked out the deal that I would do the book. And I have to say what I really like about it, uh, I think historical nonfiction is probably not my primary genre as a translator, but I do it occasionally. And what I really liked about, what I like about historical nonfiction in general is that you learn so incredibly much about a topic that you never knew anything about. Um, who knew about how a hand rolled cigar is made? I mean, there are three different, <laughs> anybody know? It's amazing. There are three or four different kinds of leaves. You've got the softer leaves. You've got the harder leaves that are on the outside to hold it all together. <laughs> um, you, and thank God for internet, right? Because I don't know how people did this kind of thing before the world of internet. Certainly not how translators did it. Because I got a book written in Dutch um, about a man who made, uh, about a, a process going on in Germany. So I've got two languages to deal with. And I'm supposed to put it into English. And so thank gosh for internet. Uh, and I had, you know, 10 tabs open about the, uh, oh, about everything you learn about, about the German railway system, about um, what kind of, exactly what kind of eagle is on the Nazi insignia uh, on their flags and how many, where he's holding a, a bunch of arrows in one hand and a bolt of lightning in the other. You, you, you learn so incredibly much. So it's like going back to school again and auditing the most fascinating class you could possibly dream of. So that in a way makes a book like this an absolute dream project, right? So I had a, I had a fabulous time looking stuff up. It could have taken me a lot less time to do the book if I hadn't spent hours getting waylaid about looking up army uniforms and about uh, German terminology and English terminology and Dutch terminology and how are you going to, um, uh, how, how we're going to reconcile the terminology uh, because a lot of the things that they wrote about, they left in German because so many Dutch people, most Dutch people can read and understand enough German that there was quite a bit of German in the book, in the original book, that couldn't be just taken over into English because English speakers are not, don't have such a great command of German. So I just, to decide how we were going to we had to go see how far we were going to go with that, right? Uh, then there were also a lot of Dutch um, Dutchisms that were that were used in the course of writing the book um, that needed to be needed to be talked about with the authors. And I have to say here that you know you couldn't ask for two more fantastic authors to work with because they they answer their phone, they answer their emails, they answer their apps. Uh, one lives around the corner from me, and whenever we needed to get together we would manage to do it and have a nice cup of coffee and discuss uh, the books. They, as you can hear, their English is great. So they could read along with me as I translated for a chapter. Um, I would send it to them and uh, um, Hella and Sandra sent their, sent, um, also thank goodness for, 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 for Microsoft Ocean do advertising for computer things, but um, that you can add comments and everybody, I knew which comment was from who. So it was a really, really nice uh, uh, collaboration. Yeah, you, it was for us. It was yes. also very nice collaboration <laughs> yeah. because what what we think is so extraordinary the work that Jonathan did that he he stayed so close the way we are our to our writings, and that yeah. we really could discuss everything, and that if you read English, it's it's still our book, and that that is it, it's a great achievement. It's really nice. And also that we became friends and that we meet from time to time and discuss also how do we get <laughs> into this Canadian fortress yeah. and, and, uh, and make the make book uh, advance. Yeah. Well, uh, Michael, you might want to say uh, a little bit or perhaps uh, Robert does this a question from Max Morrow wanting to know about the process of bringing the book 
to us in the, in the final English version, the, the book that I'm holding up here to remind you that you can buy the book and uh, please don't just buy one copy. You must know somebody else who would like to read it as well. So buy two or three. <laughs> okay, uh, so Michael, would you like to talk about that or Robert, which, which of you would like to take this question from Michael, Matt? why don't you talk about Laura. the process of being the book and then I'll talk quickly about how you and I work together in the afterward. After Well, first of all, I should identify Max Morrow as a brilliant young Canadian um, uh, actor who once appeared uh, in a Mordecai Richler uh, property um, and uh, is, is a, a wonderful young man in his own right, who has also written a memoir. So what he really wants to do is get some free literary agency advice on camera, which I'm delighted to give. Um, mm -hmm. This process was was complicated because this was not the type of book that was likely to appeal to a big commercial house like Penguin Random House or Harper Collins. So it became a, a book that I targeted the university presses with. And now, thank goodness, the university presses who used to appeal to an audience under 10 people have begun to develop a trade part of their practice uh, and I went to the uh, a highly recommended group uh, led by Lisa Quinn Claire does the the marketing uh, and they have been absolutely wonderful um, in in the sense that they were deeply committed to the translation which as I say they in part paid for um, through whatever sources they have but then they were very involved in editorial and have been extremely involved in the marketing efforts as uh, uh, Bobby and I have attempted to not let the book lie fallow. So, Bob, why don't you talk more about our relationship? Um, well, Michael and I have known each other for a long time. He's been my lawyer, my friend, my agent. Uh, and um, he came to me with this, I guess, about two years ago. And those of you who know Michael, uh, he's a dog with a bone once he gets an idea in his head. And he would drag me out Saturdays for coffee. And um, the theme always was, this isn't just a little family history story. This was always what we wanted to do. We went up the Jewish archives to look at the actual Gutenberg ledger. And the whole idea was that this is a universal story. Um, as you know, I'm a criminal lawyer in Toronto and I have people come from all over the world, um, which is a great thing about Toronto. And um, just a very quick anecdote, if, Few, about a year ago, as we were working on this, I had a, some young guys whose family was from uh, the East Indies, but they were of Indian descent. And I said, well, do you ever find out about your original family? Um, and they kind of looked at me, they said, that's amazing you asked. Our family left Goa, which is in South India, in the 1890s. And last year we went back, we found all these distant cousin of ours. And it's really our story. So that was the theme. We went through many, many drafts. And finally, I kind of came up with the afterword of talking about my own daughter, whose name happens to be Helen, and how in many ways I see reflected in her the story of, uh, of our own family. So it was a real privilege to write this. And, um, you know, right now it seems everyone is fascinated in two things, in their own genealogy, but also, um, I think we've all read all the kind of primary and secondary stories about the war and the Holocaust. And actually, I want to talk about myself, but in my new book, I'm really delving into what happened in, in Europe after World War II and people who survived the, the war. These are what I kind of call the tertiary stories. What was happening, the actual day to day, like what was it like? And the, the fascinating thing for me about the book is what was it like in the 1930s? when you're running this factory, uh, the only me mechanized factory in this Jewish man and how he's fighting and, and the campaign against him. And sadly, it reflects very much about the propaganda we hear today. I mean, it was quite a scary actually reading a book thinking, well, well, this is the kind of thing, um, you know, even that small passage that I read about the, the newspaper and uh, being joyous about this. So, so I think that was a theme that Michael and I always wanted. And that was 
really the kind of spiritual connection. I should say, by the way, this is the first time that I've met my distant cousins. So uh, you folks, except for a very brief uh, practice session yesterday, you're seeing the first time that I'm meeting my cousins. It's a real honor. We must have a family reunion. I, I see one of the people on on the in the chat line is uh, somebody called Sasha. Sasha Jacob. Yep. And he appears to be the grandson. He's he's a, a, a direct cousin of us. Yes, I just cousin. have you, but you've surely you've met you've met Sasha before. Oh, Sasha <laughs> introduced me to to Hella and Sandra. Yeah, it oh, was so you did it. It he's was one of the children it, on the pic first picture. Yeah, it, yeah. it was it was he's also Sasha's, a grandson of Isa. Yeah. yeah, his mother and Louis Rotenberg's daughter were best friends. That was the connection, and it was it was the the grandson of Louis Rotenberg that connected us. Could I just make one aside, which which universalizes the story? Um, I once took an adult education course in which they said that the most um, successful Broadway show in history was Fiddler on the Roof, and this educator could not understand how a story of a shtetl with, with, with a, a orthodox people running away from tyranny, et cetera. Why would anybody care about that story unless they were orthodox Jews, whatever? And this educator flew to Japan for opening night and there was a standing ovation and he went out in, into the foyer at intermission I walked up to a young Japanese man and said, how can you relate to this unbelievably specific story? And the young man turned to him and he said, no, no, it's my story. That's what I think this is. It's a universal story. Michael, you're right, because I, as soon as I started reading it, I felt that way about it. Um, uh, there's a very interesting comment here that I think leads to a question to the, the authors. Uh, both of whom are still awake. I'm <laughs> glad to hear. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's really a comment that translates into a question. It's from Tineke von den Klinkenberg. <laughs> and, and, and it's what, it, what, what she says here is, uh, am I right that I understand Isai as a man who never wanted to bow for the Nazis and he fought them straight in their faces? That was for me so astonishing to read. And Sasha Jacobs uh, says, Issei was a proud Jew. Can yeah. you do, is, could you talk a little bit about him in that, in the context? Yeah, I think this, never bowing. It, it, it is the very essence, I think, of, of the book uh, that you see it struck us very much as well, that he seemed not to, to be afraid and he, 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 he wasn't going to show himself as being weak or being harassed or being a Jew in Nazi Germany and therefore ready to do anything they, uh, they told him to do. He was fighting until the end. And um, well, that seemed to us also reckless in a way how could he do that knowing what was going on at that time in, in Nazi Germany? But uh, it seemed that didn't affect him personally. He just refused to, to, to bow to them. And uh, I, I think uh, this is really the, 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 the core, the, the, the gist of, of the book that yeah. you see that to our, our amazement that he didn't flee and he, he fought, although all the odds were against him. Yeah. Never gave up or never gave in. No, that's right. No. Or, or, or looking for a solution. And he did it from he was 12 or 13 already. So maybe, I don't know. We, but the, big, the thing is, uh, we could write this book when our parents were no longer al alive. But at the same time, it was a pity because we couldn't ask them 
details on how he acted in different circumstances. But what we found out is that he, he just was someone, yeah, looking for a solution and not being chased away, not being not as a Jew and not as a human. Maybe his Jewishness was not that important for him. He said, I'm, I'm a human being. I have the right, I'm a civilian in Germany or in the Netherlands or whatever, and I have the right to be here. And I have to got the same rights as you have. Don't tell me what to do. Uh, you, that's myself. great. That's great. You said, you said a very interesting thing about him, which I think was the whole point is he didn't live his life as a victim. No. 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 Uh, so my, a really important. That's an important. I think it's an important part of the book. It's an important thing to say about him, that that he he did he did not he did, he never he never said, "I give up." No. So then that was also something. Uh, uh, how do you say? How do you say that? Uh, a way of 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 living or um, and live and giving to your children as well, because in our family, which is quite astonishing from the five of the six, six grandchildren of our great parents uh, joined the, the allies, went into the British Marine and, and or four of them. And we, by researching, doing research for this book, we found out that one of them joined the partisans in, in Italy. So they were not just waiting, even when they fled, they were not waiting that war was going over. No, they were fighting back. And that is uh, a way of, yeah, how you kill, who, how, I don't yeah. find it. It's a right. really great it's leg legacy, yes. I think. Yeah, it's a legacy. A legacy. <laughs> I think it, that yeah. it is, it's the, it's the best, I think it's a, that's a really good way to look at it. Now, let me just ask you another question while we wait for more questions for the, from the audience, although we don't have much time left. So please, um, please let, let me have questions. But uh, let me ask you, what happened to, did you manage to find any of the people who ha he had worked with, people who, who were uh, um, involved in his factory? or any of the people who, who tried and finally succeeded in, uh, in taking it away from him. Um, there, there, there are a number of names that come up in the book and I wondered what happened to all those people because it would be nice to know that they were prosecuted. No, no that's, it, it, when we found out about the whole thing, it was 80 years later. I know, so but they, no, nobody nice to know. was alive anymore. No, no, and oh, yeah. so nobody was around anymore by the time you no, found no. out about it. Yeah, yeah. Because the but, core of the book is, is it, it's in the 30s, not in the 40s. Oh, I, I realize. Yeah. I just wondered yeah. if, yeah. if they were, well, what about the, do you know what happened to some of the really, uh, the Nazis who managed yeah. to? Yeah, yeah, we know. Uh, well, most Nazis weren't prosecuted after the war. I know. Uh, only a few of them. And um, uh, the people, I think, the, I, I'm i not sure whether one of them uh, that was involved in this factory was even persecuted. I don't think so. Prosecuted. I don't think so. But no, I have... I, 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 uh, we did research in it, into it and um, uh, fi if there was somebody, we found out about it, but I don't remember. I don't think there was any, there any was one court one. case. <laughs> Do you and there, there is also this, this, this amazing story about the, the secretary of the, of the city council who, yes. who was the, who was the pair of the mayor when the city was still democratic. And when the Nazis came, Nazis came, he he continued, he, he was the one with the key of, of, of the city council. And when the Nazis fled, he he welcomed the the, the Russians. So and then in then uh, when um, uh, German, when that part of Germany became East Germany, he continued to be to be have a function in in the city so he was whatever um 
uh, you, ch you change this code every every few <laughs> he, years. He, he, yeah, yeah. And ma and managed to uh, managed. What to, happened to Mr. Kronstein? We don't know. No, no, no. We don't know. Okay, we try to find there, out. There was another. Can if I can add something. The, there, can I add something? There's there's some other sort of secondary stories in this that happened. Uh, for instance, the mayor. Can you remember? Uh, help me. What his name was? There was the mayor of Durban. Who, who was actually a really kind of a mild guy. And he yeah. did his best. Uh, he did his, actually his best for the factory and for Rottenberg. And he, um, just for the forum, because you had to join the Nazi party, he did, but he wasn't a very good Nazi. And so they kicked him out and they fired him from his job. And they, um, they denied him a pension. And the poor man died. No, no, he, and he no. He never became a, a Nazi. No, no. He never he didn't even he become a Nazi. Social. So no, no, no. He was a social. Yeah, so, so oh, there were yeah. so there were quite a there were there are quite some interesting secondary stories amongst these people who actually did try to help. And what's interesting about this book is, like in real life, not everything is black and white, and not everybody was good or bad. Um, and there were there were quite some people who first started out, you think they were going to be good, but then they turned out to be incredibly vicious. <laughs> For example, the, the attorney of our grandfather, who was yeah. young, and he was doing great. He wrote his beautiful yeah. letters and, and came yeah. up for him. And then we found out he but he was member from yeah. the Nazi party from 1931 already. Yeah. And, so there's, and there's, there's, really there's, there's, do not understand. How is yeah. that possible? How could Isai work together with someone yeah. who was a convinced Nazi? Well, they did. They probably yeah. could find each other. And yeah. Yeah, we have read everything he did for him. That was yeah. great. And I think that's what that's what kind of recommends this book to readers. Yeah. I want to do a pitch for the book in general. Um, you know, for readers who are not just interested in World War II, um, you know, hard facts and and because there are a lot of there's a lot of World War II literature out there. And this, what's great about this book and about the story is it's in, there's a lot of layers to it. There's, there's, a, there's the personal layer that Sandra and Hella talked about at great length at the beginning about their grandfather and their family and, the, and, and how every, uh, the, the feelings amongst the family members. But there's also the historical, the very factual thing about the whole uh, rise to power of the Nazis. But then there's also the, the, the layers of what went on in this little town of Doboln. And they have a lot of eyewitness uh, accounts of people who were children at the time and who you did meet when they were then elderly people. And they talked about what it was like. So there's the alternation also between um, them jumping occasionally to the present and talking about their families, how they, how they are now or about the funeral of one of their parents makes this book a really special, um, a special book that's not just a history book. It's okay, and it's great. not just more and more. It's all it's all of it layered on top of each other. Like Thank very you. basic tiramisu. <laughs> oh, I like that. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate that. Now yeah. we're 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 coming to the end of this fascinating time. I do want to look at uh, questions. There's one question here from Lisa Bereskin. Bereskin. Uh, yeah. I, she's uh, she wants to know how. The book has been received by younger people in Holland. And, and of course, this is a question that worries a number of us looking at, uh, at the world today. Are young people still reading history? How are they interested in these stories? How was the book received by young readers? I cannot tell in general, but I have a 20 year old daughter and one of her, her friends was here i was not here and he picked the book <laughs> he took it home he said i have to read this um well we got a lot of 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 reactions of readers and they are of all ages but i don't know i can't i cannot t say something in general about it you hella no i don't i no. i have no idea but uh, well of course there are always young people who are interested in history and who are interested especially in 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 world two yeah. in in, a, in a nazi rule and how to deal with it and then this story is not so much about the world war but about a, a, a period about which much less is written namely the 30s and how the 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 
in a small town this worked out and in fact this is still relevant what do you do when uh, a, a dictatorship uh, 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 emerges and 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 how does uh, does an administration and just citizens react so I think it, it, it would be still relevant for young people right now. Whether they want to read it is another thing. I don't know. <laughs> well, they should read it. And I'm going to hold up the book one more time so everybody can see it. And you can recognize it in your bookstore where you're going to be visiting shortly in order to buy multiple copies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's the book. And thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Hella. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jonathan. It was uh, terrific. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, I do hope there's going to be a big family reunion. I'd like to be invited as an honorary Rottenberg. <laughs> yeah, we will certainly we will. do, Anna. Thank you so much for hosting this meeting. Anna, thank you you're, you're, you're a gem. Thank you, thank you. I owe you. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> Thank you all. That was terrific. I really enjoyed it and I love the book. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Oh, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. I thought that went 